stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping at the Hollywood Museum, and today we're going to talk to uh, two authors who wrote one book. Each comes with a different background, but they've worked together on gratitude and trust, six affirmations that will change your life. They are longtime friends, screenwriter, director Tracy Jackson, and screen uh, songwriter and composer and Oscar winner Paul Williams. They're waiting to be profiled. Born and raised in Santa Barbara, Tracy Jackson is an author, blogger, screenwriter, director, and producer. She commutes between New York and Los Angeles and never misses a beat. I've known her since she was in her teens. Uh, she has a lovely mother who's, who is Beverly, and Beverly and I were great fans of antique Chinese gowns, which we always wore. Was your mother an influence in any way on what you've been doing? Not on what I've been doing. She was an no. influence, but not on what I've been doing. <laughs> not on what you've been doing, because you started writing comedy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, my mother writes books on Chinese textiles and, <laughs> and things like that. But I suppose watching her, I, you know how my mother was an influence in watching a woman get older and continue to work and continue to be vital and to reinvent herself. Which, Which was my she last did. book. And, and so I think that was an influence to me that I could always keep going on. And even if one phase, part of my life phased out, I could retransition and do something new. And that you never got too old to work. And that you could, and I think she's been a great influence in that respect. Did you ever figure that you had to transition oh. from one yes from one space to another absolutely when i was well when i when i got to be in my late 40s i had to transition out of being a screenwriter oh did you transition out of totally, that totally because so what were you writing at that time i mean the year i got sort of my career ended i had three films made one of them confessions of a shopaholic another one called the other end of the line an indian film and then a documentary i made called lucky ducks and that was and then a film i worked on got made. Um, so I, you know, and that was sort of, and I got to be 48, and that was kind of a little old and for Hollywood. And so I just realized I didn't want to be the oldest girl in the room, and so I transitioned out, and I started writing books. But is that when you went to New York? When did no, you go I went to New York? York? I went to New York when I got married. I, at 40, I went to New York. You went to New York. Mm. Okay. When Were I turned you 40, I went to, yeah. working on TV? Were you? No, cheap films. But I had a really vital nine years or eight years in but New you've York. done a lot of tv I did, a lot, I did tv when i lived here when i knew you and, and was living here i did tv you were doing tv and then i trans then i did film and then but, i transitioned out of film and then i started writing books and blogging and but now, tell us about that shopaholic because i think that's going to lead into this affirmations on uh changing your life and and uh addiction but, in a way that would be my addiction i never was <laughs> i was never addicted to drugs or alcohol i got through the 70s and knowing a lot of people and... I you, used to say people don't invite me to the bathroom at that time. No, me either. And I never knew what anyone was doing because if, you're, if you don't take drugs, no one does drugs around you. Did you find that? So people were doing drugs and I didn't even know it. Like my writing partner, Paul Williams, I didn't know. But, um, but I didn't, you know, that wasn't my thing, shopping. I always figured, why waste money on cocaine when I could have a pair of shoes? Oh, so that was the difference. Yeah, yeah but, that, but that was so much better, wasn't it? Well, for me it was. Yeah, I think for I everyone. mean, other people, well, yeah, it probably would have been for other people too, but they didn't know, think of it that way. So conf I did Confessions of a Shopaholic, and it was not my book. It was Sophie Kinsella's book, but I certainly related to it because it had been always the thing that, you know, that was my way of self-soothing. Paul and I talk a lot in the book about self-soothing and, and people's different choices for how they either push away feelings or make themselves feel better in moments of anxiety. And so shopping's always done it for me. Much like Holly Go Lightly, I could walk into a store and nothing bad could happen to me did there. You, did you bring those things out in Lucky Ducks, which was about yourself? Well, that was about my daughter being spoiled and ended up being about me spoiling her. That was a 
look at parenting. So that was a whole different thing. That was thing. a documentary when I took my daughter and made her work in a slum in India when she was 15 to show her how the other three quarters live. And how did it work? Well, that didn't work as well as I thought it would, so we kept <laughs> filming for two years, and then it, the problem ended up being me. It's a look at parenting and, and kind of affluenza. And then, and then was there comedy involved all I the way think, along? I think my nature is to look at things comedically. So even if I'm doing something really serious, and even in this book, which is serious, it's still funny. I think that it's, I think if you look at the world in a, through a funny lens, serious things can still be amusing. Did you ever do stand-up comedy? Because you mm. wrote comedy, yeah, yeah. didn't People you? People wanted me to. I couldn't do it. I you, tried. I, I, it was too I couldn't do it. But I, look at you. You can sit and talk. Yeah. You can blog. Yeah. You can do interviews. But I don't want to go to a bar and talk to people and make them laugh. That just never appealed to me. Okay. So. I, just, I, 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 I couldn't do it. I just, I, a different skill set. So where does the comedy come from? Because you have a very serious vein. Yeah. And then you have a way of giving it to us in a comedic way. Well, I think comedy, I'm less funny than I used to be. I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, no, I'm much less funny, and it worries me. I think the less angry you get, and the, and the more sort of zen I get, and the then more you're... happy I get, and the, more, uh, the less funny I am. I think, I think anger fuels comedy, and I think almost anyone you talk to who's a funny person will tell you that. So I think that I was angry about things for a long time. I, I think I was confused. Be... And, I, and I, the way I dealt with it was by being funny. Comedy is a great distancer. It separates you from your feelings. It separates you from other people. Oh, right. So it's a great gig, and it pays well. But eventually, I think it wore out its welcome, and I moved into another direction. But gratitude and trust is not funny. It can be. You the... think it is? Where, what's funny? Well, no, I think the book has humorous moments. Okay, I don't think the, con okay. Okay. the concept is not funny. The concept really is that we are all addicted to something. Okay, so how did it come about, first of all? Well, the book came about, I've always had recovery envy. I've always been really envious of people who went through recovery, because I've always felt we should all go through recovery. And why? Because you had a lot of friends like that? Were I've had like... a lot of friends like that. We've all had a lot of friends like that. Um, but but I've... did they talk about it with you? Yeah, but I, you know what I always saw? I saw people who really bottomed out. I saw people who had tremendous problems. And then I saw people who were the most honest, trustworthy, self-revelatory, compassionate, grateful people. And I saw this great switch, and I saw them stay in it. And I thought, well, why couldn't we all be like that? You know, we all have problems. We're all addicted to something. We all have this some pleasure principle that we push. Wouldn't we all be better if we were grateful, we had a higher power, we thank, you know, we gave back, we took daily inventory? Who, who couldn't benefit from those additions to their life. So that was always something that was in the back of my head, but I never really acted on it. But were those people in their own little groups, or were you in their little group with them? No, or I was never in their group. how did you know with... about it, what well, they were about... doing? Well, because I had friends who, were, who went through recovery, yes, and, then and then they would share with me. Okay. I had been to meetings with friends a couple times, um, but I just saw the difference in people. But you see that one thing in people is there's all different kinds of addictions, which you say. Yeah, everyone. Right? Everyone's got something. You know, now it's phone. We, everyone, look, at, look at people walking down the street. Everyone's staring at their phones. People uh, now get a That's an addiction, It's right. a total addiction because you get a dopamine rush when you press your phone. Exactly. How many people liked my Facebook page? How many people liked oh, my I Instagram know. picture? How many people like me today? So that kind of validation sends off an endorphin, which is very much like anything, like sugar or anything else. So, very interesting because that's what the whole thing is about. Sugar addiction. Number one addiction in America. You know? Were um, you ever addicted to sugar? I was chubby. I, I don't know if I was no, addicted to sugar. That's what I mean. Are we? How do we Oh, we're know? very addicted to sugar because sugar is in everything. <laughs> it's in everything. It's in everything. Yeah. And, then the, and actually, the food companies make sure we're addicted to sugar from the time we're very young. To make sure that we like that and need it And we it keep more buying it. more. Yeah, you know, they put sugars in things it doesn't need to be in. Salad dressing. Why do you need to put sugar in salad dressing? I know. You know? So, so this stemmed from that, that concept. So how did it happen, though? How did it happen? Here you were. You knew Paul for years. I knew years. Paul for years, forever. I was a big fan of his when I was young. Um, and who wouldn't be? And, and who, who wasn't? Be. And he was adorable. And, and then we became best friends about 14 years ago. And we'd always wanted to work on something together. And he, had this, he has a wonderful documentary, Paul Williams Still Alive, that, that, and he scored my documentary, Lucky Ducks. So we had worked together. Oh, he did yeah, score your he, Well, he wrote a great, great song for me. And so when his documentary came out, he was giving a lecture, and I was, had attended it, and he was talking about how his, his choo-choo, a little childish but sweet, ran on the twin rails of gratitude and trust. 
And when he said that, it was an, uh, an Oprah aha moment. A light bulb went out, and I thought, oh, wow, this is it. Gratitude and trust, recovery is not just for addicts, which was the original title of the book. It's not just for addicts. That was the original title right. of the book. But people thought that, well, the publishers thought that that wouldn't sell in the Midwest. And then how did you decide on six affirmations? I mean, aren't there like 10, 20, no, 30 recovery, different things yeah, you can do? Yeah, of course there are. But and also, if you go to meetings, don't you learn these same kind of things? Why Absolutely, but the average so person doesn't go to meetings. So this is for everybody. Oh, oh, I see. So this is different. This is something that they would This is for have. everybody. I see. Uh, okay. The original jumping off point for the the 12 steps, which we are not, was the Oxford group, and that has six tenets. We went back to those, and then we recreated what we, we made them our own. So You changed things We changed around, around for ourselves. So our, you know, our first affirmation is something needs to change, and it's probably me, which is admitting that I have a problem, no matter what it is, it's my, as an adult, right. it's my responsibility to fix it. You can no longer it's, blame your parents, you can no longer right. blame your siblings, you can no longer blame your long the People life, around you. It's yours. You, right. you know, as an adult, you have to fix yourself. Right. Or you can continue to blame other people and pass the buck. It's a very easy, simple thing to do, but not, you know, many people have a hard time doing it. But it's hard to say, it's me. I looked at him the wrong way. I said the wrong word. You know, I initiated this anger in him when it's like me. When it's me. And you know what, Joan? It could even be someone else. But your response to it's you. So maybe there's someone exactly. in your life that's toxic. Maybe there's someone that's pushing your buttons. Maybe that's someone that you didn't do it. Maybe you didn't pick the fight. But how you respond to it and how you react to it, that's on you. And that's what a lot of people... So it doesn't always have to be, I'm the problem. There's so many different ways. We have, every day is problem solving in life. You know, you, you get through one and there's another. So it's how do you respond to that, you know... How do you respond? I mean, I had a really big problem with, I, don't, I hate incompetence. When I'm on the phone forever <laughs> on, you know, with, with someone at the other, and I, and I would and get snarky, and they, they're not doing their job. Now I go, I know it's not your fault. I know you didn't, oh, don't own this company. I don't, you don't make the rules. But, and I just go into the problem a little differently than just on the attack. But that's great to do it that way. Yeah. I mean, it's much more sensible, isn't it, than saying, why did you do it? And those people get attacked all day. And then you feel badly. Then you, you know, then you have sort of a bad taste in your mouth for your own negativity. And why carry negativity? But is it your negativity that you're, like, being smart about and coming back and hitting them on a different way? Well, I think it's my awareness of how I behave as a human being. Yeah, I think that's true. You know, I think who it's am I? How, do I? how do I want to walk through the world? How do I want to respond to other people? How am I going to respond to frustration, to tension, to setbacks? That's all on my plate. So tell me one other affirmation. Well, I think, I think my favorite is, Paul and I have some of the same favorites. I know what he'll say. So I think uh, I, will, I will learn from my mistakes and not defend them is a oh. great one. You know, oh. I love that one. That's really difficult. Well, it's difficult until you make it a pra like anything else. You know, you can say it's difficult. Like you can say dieting is difficult. It's difficult until you make it a part of your life. Exercise. But people don't like to be wrong. No, but, but <laughs> they don't like to be wrong. But, you know, when you say, I will learn from my mistakes and not defend them, then actually you're not wrong because you're taking that error okay. and you're making it your teacher. What we like to say is, you know, our mistakes are our classroom. So if you look at something where our you screw up. Our mistakes are our classroom. That's great. You know, if you look at some place where you screw up during the course of the day and you say, okay, how am I going to do this differently next time? That's all you have to do. And the next time, maybe you do do it differently. So every day is the classroom, and you don't look at yourself with shame, and you don't look at it with regret, and you don't beat yourself up. You go, okay, I screwed up. I'm human. We all are. But how am I going to do this next time? Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. We'll be right back with Paul Williams. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn. And welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. As I said, we were talking about one book, and we had two authors. Tracy Jackson was just on the first part of the show. And now we have Oscar Grammy Award winner Paul Williams, who was born in Omaha and moved all over the Midwest with his family until age 13 when he went to live with an aunt in Long Beach. And that's where he finished high school. And as he said, no more education. 
That's it, you know, and that's the most fascinating part of my story right there. You've just told that, you know, that's the spellbinding part of the story. But at 50... How do we follow that, Joan? At 50, you went back and you got a certificate and you were teaching at UCLA you know, well, and no, I, 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 At 49, I got sober, which was the big, you know, I went for, I, for instead of... <laughs> Coming to, I woke up one morning, I started a life in sobriety, and because I loved it so much, I wanted to work in recovery. So I that went to UCLA perfect. and got my certification as a drug and alcohol counselor. But that was a lot of education. It was when a you year. Say no more education, it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know it what it was, year. but it was, it was also, a, you know, I've always joked that I know of one life I saved for sure, and that would be mine. I know, uh, that's that it fantastic. Was, it was, a, it was a wonderful way for me to really stay connected to, my, to recovery, the world of recovery, and make that my focus in the early years. And, you've, and you went into the music program there. So you were mentoring in the music program well, also, I, right? Well, I worked for the, you know, <coughs> there's a guy named Buddy Arnold who started the Musician's mm. Assistance Program. As oh. Buddy would say, Buddy talked like this, and he'd say, you know, I've got to tell you, musicians are usually over-medicated and underinsured. <laughs> we had to start a program to put, put guys into recovery and oh. put them into treatment that can't afford it. So we started Started, he started MAP, the Musician's Assistance Program, which is now, thankfully, part of Music Cares and, at, the, at Neris, and, and it's, it's, our, it's the treatment wing <coughs> of Music Cares for addiction. That's fantastic. It's so I'm going to go on with my introduction. He's okay. written songs that we will never forget, songs that we've only just begun, Rainbow Connection, Rainy Days and Mondays. We'll never forget those songs. Okay. And you've been on the Carson Show 48 times. Exactly. And only remember. I always joke, that's my, my bumper sticker line about it, is that I've been on for 48. I, I actually look at the list. Carson Show 48 times, and, and I look at people, that, Aunt Paul Williams and Anthony Quinn were the guests, and I'm like, I met Anthony Quinn. I didn't know I knew Anthony Quinn. You know. But how, do you, how did you get through those? How did you get through those programs? That's what I like to know. Well, uh, you know, as, as, as Tracy reminds me, one of my stock lines, alcoholism is a progressive disease. And I don't know when I crossed the line from use to abuse to addiction, but I did. So in the early years, in the 70s, I was amazingly productive. And I pro was using alcohol probably more than most social drinkers do, but I, but I was still functioning pretty well. In the 80s, How were my you addiction, my, well, in the 80s, my, my addiction to, to alcohol <coughs> and cocaine outran my addiction to the, all the attention, and I began to hide. Oh, they were both together. So well, I love the, you know, when you're little, when you're, when you're a tiny little guy and you're different, it's difficult. When all of a sudden everybody's treating you like a big deal, that's pretty addictive. And I got addicted to the attention. I still get a little nudge from it. You slap on the lights and there's a little part of me that goes, yeah, you know, I have to watch that. But isn't that good in a way? I mean, it is self-affirming. Well, it is self-affirming, and when you have a healthy approach to it, when you have a mission, right. and I think <laughs> Tracy and I have a mission at this point. We love the work we're doing at Grat Gratitude and Trust. This is the most important thing I've ever done in my life, Joan. I know. I can't believe it. Everything that you've done over the years, yes. I mean, I'm talking about Oscars and Grammys and president of ASCAP and, I mean, major, major, I mean, I'm going to make you more addicted to your own fame, oh, but, I, I mean, major yeah. fame. And this is your passion. But you know what, Hat, yeah, and it's really interesting because I went from the fame to not to just disappearing. And if people ask me right now what were the most important years of my life, I would probably say the years that I disappeared. And there's a very simple reason. Because there was a point in my life when I was healthy and I was back and I had developed the friendship with Tracy that I had. When Tracy said to me, there is, there is a way for you to, you know, to the question which people ask again and again and again, which is, why don't the rest of the, why doesn't the rest of the world have something like you guys in, 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 the, in, the, in a, that are alcoholics? Why don't you have, why don't we have something like what you have? And I, and I've heard that for, Joan, for 25, almost 25 years. I never had an answer. And Tracy said, I'm going to tell you, let's write a book called Gratitude and Trust. Because that's and find how, a way to share what you've been given. But that's what you've been looking to give to people, right? You and know, now it came out in the book. It's fantastic. And you have to tell you that the man that started that program, that's, I don't talk about the program that <laughs> saved my life. I don't talk about the program, and I don't even mention them on the air, the, at the front of the, of the phone book, that one, that very famous one. But with the you 12. Go, do you, did you go to that? Yeah, they saved my life. But, but I'm not going to talk about them specifically. But what's interesting is, the, is in the very beginnings of that program, when when the when the steps were put together, the first twelve the way the first the first version of the twelve steps said that 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 
that it was for everybody, that, you know, right. that having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we would carry this message to everyone, especially alcoholics. Now, it was changed through the years, I'm told. Oh, but, I see, but, because you said it was more than alcohol with yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. When it, but, wait, but you did go to those programs, and they do have a list of things. How is yours different? Well, hopefully the, be the, the parts of it that are the best are the parts that are similar, where you look at your oh, life, you know. I see, yeah. So, I, I mean, the said. fact is that, that that program that you're talking about that I don't mention on television, I've actually talked about it now more than I've ever talked about it in a single <laughs> city. But I'll tell you that that, that was the, the, the principles that are, that are you know, the, the headwaters of, of these affirmations and these principles go back to Buddhism, to Hinduism, to Judeo-Christian ethics and all, and specifically as they relate to putting your life together, probably the, or the, the Oxford group with the six tenets were probably as close to what we have here. But, you know, but it's actually, you know, Tracy talked about it. It's, 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 all, it's so much of it's in that first affirmation. You know, I will, something needs to change and it's probably me. Well, but it's, that's the first realization, right? Oh, yeah. That there's something wrong. Well, you know, that probably is, <laughs> is, gives you a little wiggle room in there. It probably me. So we look probably. at it. <laughs> and we and we walk you through a way to look at this, write some, you know, you know, answer some questions. Look at your life and go, what isn't working? And you know, it may not be that it's that it's not working to the extreme that my life wasn't working because I was near death. This book is for people with life limiting habits. I had life, I had a, a life threatening disease. What I'm thrilled oh. to say is people with life threatening diseases are using the book as well. And they can be cured from this disease. Well, this is pretty much cure. Well, no, you know, I, w I would say that, that, that we have the possibility of, of living a long and fruitful, oh, okay. healthy life. But you know what? I, people ask me if I'm recovered. Joan, <laughs> ask me if I'm a recovered alcoholic. Are you a recovered alcoholic? No, ma'am. I'm a recovering alcoholic. Recovering. When I Yeah, when I'm recovered, I quit learning. Yeah, exactly. And I will die an alcoholic. But I haven't had a drink in almost 25 years. I think the that's life fantastic. I have, oh, it's the best now, ever. we talked about, you know, your, your lack of education. But so you were a singer, a songwriter, a composer, an actor. How did you become successful in all of this? When you really didn't have that kind of education. Well, I think that the fact what you know what I was good at was was communicating with people, and and what I was also I just didn't but have. You can communicate, but you can't write a song. I can't write a song. Oh yeah, but you know what? I for can't some, sing. Uh, maybe it's past life. Maybe I was somebody. Uh, maybe I was a composer in a past life. Who knows? But the fact is that part of my success is not what's different about me, but what we have in common. If I write honestly about what's going on in the center of my chest, I'd be willing to bet I write about things that you've felt too. And so when, when, you know, if I'd had a great education, as a matter of fact, when I get into my head and I'm writing, one of the things I heard from Tracy again and again and again while we're working on the book, I'd write something that was intelligent about my childhood and it was, right. uh, and, and Tracy would say to me, uh-uh, go deeper, Paul. Go deeper, you know. What she acted what, as yeah, your what, psychiatrist. Yeah, she said, what, <laughs> what, <laughs> did it feel like when you when you woke up in, in a bedroom of of, two, of a home of two people that you had never met? You lost your mother and your father and your brother. I what know. did it feel like? So when I could go deeper, whether it's as a songwriter or as a, as a, as a, an author, if I can be honest and share. And the you know, the great thing about this is Tracy and I are not professional any things. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm a yeah, songwriter yeah. and all that, but as far as sitting, well, I'm not a psychiatrist or a priest, you know, neither is she. She's had her issues with shopping and she'll sell you men or whatever. The minor was, you know, was uh, cocaine and alcohol. But the fact is, I think the, the fact that we open our lives to the, to the reader gives, gives it two things. It gives, it gives us authenticity and it gives you humor because, you know what, what we went through and the way we tell it, it's pretty funny. But, but when you look back, and you just mentioned all these tragedies, and you mentioned this life of alcoholism and cocaine and whatever, how did you, did you use those experiences in your songs? Oh, I think, my, I think the best songs are about what's going on in the center of my so chest at the like time, whatever. or the characters, yeah. I but see. the other thing I want to correct you on is that the hardcore alcoholism and cocaine addiction came at the end of my career. When not, you were... Well, at the end of the oh. drinking of you. In other words, I was very successful, very successful, disappeared. What happened? Where did he go? He got drunk. He got loaded <laughs> yeah, and he disappeared. Right. And what happened when he came back? When he came back, you know, I've had an amazingly successful return to my career. I have a life that is richer today and more fulfilling uh, than I could have imagined. So mo a lot of these things came after you became sober, a lot of these accolades. 
Well, you know, I had a lot of accolades back when when before, I was but before. Also. But what I'm saying is that is that the alcohol and the cocaine separated me from my creative life. Right. My creative <laughs> life in its initial incarnation uh, was very successful, and it and it garnered a lot of attention and a lot of awards. But you know what? While I was involved in that, you know, my connection to the rest of the world was kind of my music. That's one step removed. That's me sort of hiding. When I if you allow me, if when I hit my knees and said, I don't know what I'm doing, I need help, I'd reached out to another human being. I'd say one-on-one -on -one connection. That's, I don't know what I'm doing, when, you need to help me. Yeah. That's, where I, that's where I learned to be a man, I think. But to write this book, after you had that documentary done about you, who did the documentary? What was his name? Steve Kessler. Steve Kessler. I was talking to my hairdresser. He said, Paul Williams, that was a great documentary. I really liked that guy. Lovely. It was real. I really felt like I knew him better than any of the other documentaries. Yeah. So that was pretty pivotal, or not pivotal, but out there. And then we get a book. We get a book, and the thing is, that with the, beyond this being a book, this is a mission for Tracy and I. As I think she told you, we just made a deal with, with Podcast One. We're, we're going forward to I do podcasts. I know you're podcasts. going to a next yeah, exactly. step after you the know, book, we'll right? Be, we'll be teaching at the Omega Conference in, in, uh, in June. We have a, a day of, of, of health and humor okay. and addiction coming up in, in, uh, in New York in, in uh, in, it's also in June. I believe the 24th, June 24th. So... Can anyone read this book? Oh, Can it's for everybody. Can anyone do it? Oh, it's for everybody. You and, know. and what is your favorite affirmation? Well, the <coughs> second affirmation is, I don't know how to do this, but something inside me does. You know, I pray to the big amigo. <laughs> I call him the big amigo. I, know, I, love, that. I, I love that. He's the big amigo. <laughs> well, like the big amigo came down and took me off the tracks or something you said. He came, uh, came down and took care of me. Well, the big, the, the big amigo has <laughs> just put my life together. You know, I get up in the morning and I say, surprise me, God. And I say, lead me where you need me. I find that if oh, I'm led where I'm needed, oh, lead I me where you need it. me, you know? I love that because it's so honest. There and is, it's like there putting is an, your trust in something. Absolutely. And there's an energy around what we're doing. And, and there's a, sometimes there's a guiding factor that I can't identify. But, you know, we went to this meeting <laughs> with Norm Pattis today. And, and it's where Tracy and I had lunch when we first <laughs> became friends. When we first became friends, not when we met, but our first lunch as friends, when, I, when we really hurt each other and all, and I met her husband, she met my wife. Was all of where? a sudden we're in each other's life. It was in the same building oh. where we met Norm Pattis today. And we thought, look at that. It, is, isn't it's that kind sir, of full, full circle, circle and all? Full circle, and yeah. I think we've come full circle today. Thanks for taking the time <laughs> with us, I have a Joan. feeling, though, that you're totally addicted to this book and this uh, message. I'm addicted to a life of love and service. I will live my life in love and service, gratitude and trust, because it, re it takes me to the <laughs> nicest people. I loved having you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Joan. Thanks for watching. Keep writing to my email, J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. See you next time.